Okay, so welcome everyone. My name is Melissa Petrangeloskaya. I am the Director of International Training at Global Rights for Women and one of the co-founders of Pathways to Family Peace, which does Batters Intervention Groups through video conference. We're joined here today with um, Scott Miller of Domestic Abuse Intervention Program. So I'll have Scott introduce himself in, in just a moment when we get to that slide. But we're going to have um, Nazifos come on, who works for Global Rights for Women, and, and give us some um, uh, tips and information about um, what, what we're doing here today. You want to go ahead, Nazifos? Uh, she's muted. Oh, Nazifos, you're muted. Hi everyone, sorry about that. Thank you, Scott. Um, my name is Nata Wazirzada and I'm the program coordinator here at Global Rights for Women. Just to start off this webinar, we're gonna go through some logistics. First off, when you join, please shut your microphone off onto mute and turn your web webcam off as well. Um, we can take care of that too as the webinar goes on. Please mute your cell phones as well. And if you have any questions or concerns or technical problems, feel free to type them into the chat box throughout the presentation. And I also put my email in there. So if you have any pressing questions or questions that require a little bit more feedback, uh, feel free to email me. And moderators will pose those questions from your comments and questions from the chat box throughout the webinar as well. And a recording of the presentation will be sent to everyone afterwards. Thank you. And just a little bit more about Global Rights for Women. We work with leaders from around the world to advance women and girls' human right to live free from violence. And we do that through legal reform and institutional and social change. Thank you. Great, thanks. So Scott, do you wanna begin introducing yourself? Sure, my name is Scott Miller. I work for the Domestic Abuse Intervention Programs uh, in Duluth, Minnesota. And so, uh, I've worked there for 20 years, and um, Ellen Pence, who was both a mentor to Melissa and myself, uh, worked with us on uh, kind of mentoring us into this coordinated community response work. And uh, currently, I'm, a, I'm the executive director there. And um, yeah, and do lots of training and lots of listening uh, to people around the country. Great, thanks, Scott. For those of you that don't know, I used to be the director at um, Duluth. I used to be Scott's boss. I used—I like to remind Scott of that when I'm with him on these. How long, how, how um, long did that last? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I wasn't very successful at bossing Scott around, uh, that's for sure. Um, but after leaving um, Duluth, then I came to Global Rights for Women and the Director of International Training there. And um, we are also just proud at um, Global Rights for Women to carry on the legacy of the work of Duluth and with many of our international partners and, and talk about coordinated community response and social change. But we have Scott here today who's going to talk with us. Um, last week we did a uh, a webinar um, that did not have Scott on it, but we had Chris Huffing and Rebecca um, Tom Ford Hauser on it from Center for Court Innovation, and they talked about their um, their sort of expertise and um, about conducting uh, risk assessment, particularly about risk assessment tools. What we wanted Scott to come on today is to think about risk and how risk gets incorporated into coordinated community response. Um, I'm sure Scott will talk about this, but for those of you that don't know. You know, Duluth was the um, is the sort of founding place of the concept of coordinated community response. And so, there's one thing to think about a tool for risk, but we want to have Scott to come on to talk about how it is that a whole coordinated community response um, addresses risk. So, Scott, I may stop you along the way if a question comes in, um, but you are free to to go ahead. All right, thank you. All right, next slide, please. So just to start, um, uh, the Duluth model is a, is a way that we organize in Duluth. Um, often it gets mistaken as a particular thing, like a men's program or, or some other product that we have produced, um, like, the, like the power and control wheel. But it's, it's not any of those things. It's how the power and control wheel was um, developed. It's how the men's program was developed. It was how our 911 policy was developed. This is the organizing method behind 
all those other things that uh, folks may know about. Um, and one of the one of the foundations of the Duluth model is that we try to get systems to align to the needs and the experiences of victims rather than making victims align to the needs uh, of the system. Um, and so turning that uh, around, uh, obviously, for those of you who, who do it, um, uh, can take some work. Um, but that's when you have a victim-centered response as opposed to a criminal justice or human service-centered um, system. Next slide, please. So the coordinating committee response is what that organizing method creates. It's all of the components of that. So, and, and I'm gonna be talking about Duluth specific. So this is one way that it can be done. It isn't the way to do it. Um, it's the way we did it, given the resources we have, uh, the relationships we have, um, and, and which, may, which, which has a tremendous impact on what you can or can't do, obviously. The coordinated community response in Duluth, the way we think about it, is not just a way of getting people to call each other and work together, but it's actually a way to institutionalize change by changing the policies and the practices um, of every agency that touches a case that comes into a government agency. So let's take criminal justice agencies as an example. When that case gets taken up by 911, we want policies and procedures in place to make it easier for law enforcement, who's the next agency that's gonna to touch that case, to do the job that they're gonna do. And then law enforcement, same thing. When they touch that case, there's a lot of people who are gonna use that report. Prosecutors, judges, probation agents, pretrial release agents, um, men's program, uh, advocates. Everybody's gonna be using that report for something different. So everybody needs to have a hand in what is in that report if it's going to be coordinated um, uh, amongst all the different partners. So we want to, by doing this, we want to change the climate of tolerance in our community for this kind of uh, behavior. And when you have guys coming into the men's program who are saying things to other men um, who, who maybe this is their first day in the group, don't drink, they'll catch you. Um, I, can't, I can't behave this way here. Where I used to live, the cops didn't do much with it. But when I moved here, not only did the cops do something with it, but I got probation officers knocking on my door. Like, you, we want them to, to have this notion that, uh, as one guy put it, this is Mississauda. Um, we want that impression um, on people in the community that this will not be tolerated here. And that coordinated community response um, is, is one of the ways in which we create that. So Scott, um, can you just say a little bit about how that's happening, and just because you're on the topic right now, kind of related to COVID, right? Like, how is it that probation right now is is uh, able to do any sort of monitoring at this time? Can you say a little bit about that, what you know about yeah. that? Yeah, so um, just uh, uh, one of the things that this unprecedented in my lifetime response uh, or circumstance has taught me is that um, this pandemic, if you have weaknesses, will expose them uh, for sure. Um, and so if you didn't know you had them, you're going to know you have them when this pandemic hit. Um, the other piece is, is that you can't, it's really hard. If you're in a lockdown situation like we are, um, it's it, almost impossible to organize something new um, because the resources, the people resource isn't there. Um, we have law enforcement um, who have 18 days off and, and five days on. And so the entire department, including command, are broken down into pods of eight officers that take different shifts. Um, and there's nobody in the office. There's no investigators to follow up with cases. That kind of thing, um, you can, if you've got a problem, you're not going to fix it. So it's really good to have all this in place before you have a, have a, 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 a tragedy such as the one we're, we're living through. So... Um, as far as probation is concerned, um, one of the things that we had to organize is how we get police reports to um, our to people uh, doing the risk, and how does that risk information then get to our probation partners, our court partners, um, and uh, uh, and the advocates. Probation specifically um, are prohibited from meeting face to face in 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 our our state um, with offenders. Um, they can do it if they get permission from a supervisor, but they can't routinely do that. 
Um, so what they're doing is that it, because the, the courthouse is shut down and the amount of hearings um, have been cut back drastically, they have a different um, amount of time than they would normally have uh, to follow up with offenders and victims. Um, and so what we've been doing with them is, is having meetings with them and, and following through on, on, on what they're learning. Um, and one of the things that they're learning um, is that uh, men's chemical use has skyrocketed. Uh, they're learning this from mm -hmm. victims. They're not learning it from offenders. And they're also we're hearing it from treatment centers. And why is that? Because the, the, the guys on their caseload know that the courthouse is closed where the UAs are done. They know that the uh, agents aren't meeting with them one-on-one, -on -one, so they're not going to do a UA. And the, the court is not holding hearings at this time on technical violations of probation, which drinking would be one on a domestic. And no drinks, mm -hmm. no use are a standard probation contract in Duluth um, when they're, we're convicted of a domestic assault. So um, that use has gone up, which has increased risk to victims. Um, so one of the things that we, as an example, last Friday um, with probation, we have a really high risk guy. Um, we've contacted him from our program. They've contacted him from probation. The things we're hearing from him are not good. The things we're hearing from her are not good. So uh, the agent and the advocates got together on a call to, to strategize how to engage with these individuals. Um, and what we did is that two agents went out one agent took him outside and kind of grilled him on his behavior, just did the typical probation kind of thing. You know, what are you doing right now? Where are you going? What, all of that. Well, the agent that had a relationship with the victim sat with her in the house and talked to her about um, what she's experiencing. And she was open um, and she said, you know, if you want to leave right now, you can pack a bag. We will escort you out. We will have, and we had organized um, money for her because he had taken her money. Um, we organized a place for her to go. Uh, so that those weren't barriers uh, prior to the agents going to the house. Um, but she decided that she did, she did not want to leave at this time. But we set up a way for her to be able to communicate um, on a fake Facebook account, uh, a code word, so that um, if something was going on and the agent got that, they'd immediately call 911. So we have a safety plan in place. That's the, but that work, that that was like, Two, uh, two and a half hours back and forth on phone calls, trying to organize everything that this one person would need. Um, and, and it just shows how hard it is to do the work when, in a pandemic when everything is shut down. So that was a long answer to a short question, but uh, hopefully that gives you some insight. Yeah, I just give insight. In particular, you know, there's um, Carl Davis has put in a comment here, and one of them is uh, we're going to, I just want to reiterate, which is that he's saying that intimate partner contacts are a must right now. And just to re re reiterate your point, Scott, which is that you're not going to find out the real deal from him, right? Like he's going to tell the probation agent, yeah, I'm not drinking, I'm not smoking weed, you know, I'm going to my job, that sort of thing. And without making that victim contact, Right. Like as, as a um, it's coordinated as a better invention program or probation, you won't find out the real situation. That is for sure, because what the what probation is saying in both the cities that we Superior, Wisconsin and Duluth, Minnesota, Southern St. Louis County, is that the guys are overwhelmingly saying everything's fine. We're good. Right. Yeah. Right. In fact, there was a large yeah. percentage of the guys that we pulled who are in our men's program who said they're not even affected by the pandemic, which is just not real. Um, so. Yeah. Right. Right. All right, next time. right. Meaning that, like, nothing stressful at home. All is good. That sort of thing. Right. Don't yeah. bo don't bother me. <laughs> Basically, it's stressful at my house. <laughs> right. So at all of the, our homes. Yeah. So one of the things about a coordinated response, um, as we talk about it, is making the violence visible, visible to the system. Make her visible to the system. Um, when you make her life visible. Um, People see things differently. If if it is if, if it's a checkbox on a risk form, that's not her life. Um, so what's her her life really involves context. It isn't just the risk factors, but it's also what is it that she's living with. Um, and so building in those tools at different points of case processing to collect that information and document it. Uh, so for example, we've got a project with. Um, uh, the Department of Human Services here, working with social workers, 
And one of the things that we found out early on in that work was that as a uh, case would move from investigation, which has 45 days in, in Minnesota to complete, to ongoing, um, I said, how does, the, how does what you have learned about the risks, the context of her life getting transferred to the ongoing agent because I wasn't seeing it in paperwork. And they said, well, we just have a conversation. I said, okay, but that's not gonna work, right? If you don't write it down, if there isn't an institutional way to capture what you know, then the subsequent worker is not, is gonna, is not gonna be able to build on um, all those experiences that you've had. So we've had to figure out a way to, to, to get that documented and make her life visible. Um, one of the things that I heard, and the reason I wrote this slide the way I did, uh, the title of it, is because in a focus group I was doing with women one time, um, uh, she was, uh, a particular woman was really articulate in that um, when you lose sight, no, she said, whatever you're gonna create, you're gonna create, but you can't lose sight of my risk, um, what I'm up against with him. Because the minute you do, I disappear, right? And so it was mm -hmm. really a way to strongly reiterate this notion that we need to find ways to collect and document so, and then distribute so that all those players in the system um, can have access to what system people learn uh, intervening in these cases. And I'm talking about government systems, not advocates. Um, that's a different uh, sector. So Scott, an example of this, I think, is um, and and you know where it was doesn't matter. But you and I went to a place one time when we were training, and well, I think one of the fascinating things that we learned is that in this country they had worked really hard on their their risk tool, right? And then when we talked to the prosecutors and the judges, and we looked at their case files, we said so. So they worked really hard on this. Why aren't you using it? I remember they said it's because they didn't organize it in a way that was helpful for us, mm -hmm. right? And and that's right. that sort of CCR thinking, which is that you don't think about what's best for ours, but how can I produce it in a way so that every institution um, makes the has the violence visible in in what they're doing? Yeah, and to your point, back in two thousand five and six, when we really started thinking about how to upgrade the way we were evaluating risk in Duluth. Um, and we started asking questions around different communities, what they're doing. And, and there was a lot of law enforcement, and I, at the time especially, who were starting to take on risk tools. Um, and then you'd ask the question, so why are you doing it? Well, because you need mm -hmm. to. Okay, but, but who uses, well, that's on them. If they wanna use it, they use it. If they don't, they don't. Okay, well, that's not coordinated. I was in Australia talking to some government folks about uh, risk. And um, one agency said, uh, the police department said, uh, mm -hmm. or the police commission, commissioner said, this is our risk tool and we're really happy with it. And there was this tone mm -hmm. like, we're happy with it and isn't gonna change. And then the <laughs> medical sector said, we have a risk tool that we're using and we're really happy with it. And I said, okay, so here's the thing, right? You could, I'm not saying whether your risk tool is good, bad or ugly, I have no idea. Here's the thing. If you're in a coordinated response, it is the question isn't, is the tool good for my agency? The question is, is the tool good for the CCR? So what right. tool is the, is the best used that by everybody? Um, and then you've got something that everybody can use. To Melissa's point, if it isn't, even if the risk information is good, if it isn't formatted in a way that the agency that's going to can take up in an efficient manner, it's not gonna go anywhere. And likely, there's risk information in there uh, or there's amount of context in there that a particular agency specifically judges aren't gonna have the time to take up. So you're gonna have to find a way to reorganize that information efficiently so that in a quick way they can glance and see uh, what the context and risk is for that particular case. And you will do that by talking to judges. They will tell you what they need and how they need it. Um, but if you don't have a conversation and you decide for them, inevitably you're gonna decide uh, incorrectly. Right. And one of the things that, well, I know you're going to talk about it, but one of the things we're going to email to people after some of these sample things, like you mentioned bail memo, we'll email to people on this webinar one of the samples of that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so one of the interesting things um, 
when we started doing this work uh, uh, back in the day is that we started interviewing people about what they would want risk information for or what they're, you know, some agencies were already doing risk information, collecting it and using it. Um, what was the point of risk to them, to, this, to the government systems? And it was reoffense and lethality, period. That, that was mm -hmm. what they, they wanted to know. Is this guy gonna be back on my docket? Is this guy gonna be back on my caseload? Am I gonna go back to that house um, or is this person dangerous to the point where he could kill somebody? I want to know those two things. And then when you start talking to victims, victims have this whole diverse way of thinking about risk. Just calling the police is a risk factor for them, especially if they don't have somebody who can tell them what's going to happen when they do call. So, for example, um, I was in a community where we were talking to the, to the women in a focus group, and each woman said, there was a different way that the, the police responded. And you really had to hope you got the right officer. Um, it was a small community. They also said that you only get one shot at the police in our town. What do you mean? Well, if you call them the first time, they'll come out, they'll arrest uh, you know, the guy. But the next time, they, they, they'll, they'll tell them before they leave, if I have to come back here, the next time you're going, if you don't get out, right? So we don't call a second time. All right, so now the system has actually become a risk to her, right? Um, and that's just one way of thinking about the multitude of risks that victims have to take up, um, as opposed to what the system wants to know, which is reoffense and lethality, which is what a lot of our tools um, are geared towards, not to her experience, right. but to the system's needs. And, and that's what a lot of the focus of the last um, webinar that we did on was on those tools, and, and that's this is just specifically it, Scott. Is they, you know, and we asked them to talk about that, right? So to talk about the risk of, of the risk tools, and that's what they specifically look at is that risk of reoffense or or lethality. And here's the and here's the thing that's really hard about organizing with that kind of a and I'm not saying the tools are fine. I mean, it isn't the tools' fault, but here's what happens: is that the government systems end up focusing so much on lethality and reoffense that they never they're blind to the risks they're creating for the victims mm -hmm. by, by either not doing what they should be or doing what they what they think is right um, and and not seeing those impacts because we know we know how risky that offender is but that's not her only point of risk that she's considering like we have to take mm -hmm. up a whole host of other issues I did, a, I did a series of focus groups um, in, uh, in a community where uh, it was so clear when you read the transcript of the focus groups that the less victims were being communicated to by the system, so probation agents weren't calling, uh, victim witness wasn't getting a hold of them, um, advocates were getting a hold of them, but they weren't liaisons between the system and what they were doing and, and what she needed. So the less that she knew about the system, the more she was getting information about what was going to happen from the offender, right? Mm -hmm. So a woman goes into the home where, and drops her kids off where he's living and opens up the refrigerator and it's full of alcohol. And she said, I didn't think you were supposed to drink when you were on probation. And he said, well, the agent was over. He saw it, not a problem. And she believed that because nobody else mm -hmm. was talking to her, right? And, right. the, and the less that she knew about the system, the more she pulled away from the system, which then creates risk because now he's her only source of information. Right. Yeah, I remember a, a time when a woman had come into my office when I was an advocate and she said, he told me if he's convicted, he'll lose his fishing license. He will never fish again, right? <laughs> and, and, and that's not true in Minnesota. No. But it, it's like, the, I always think of that when this topic comes up, because it reminds me of wh what you just said, Scott, which is that when he's the only source of information to her, it's hard not to believe it, right? Um, right. Most men who better women are very convincing in, in many ways, and he had convinced her. And I was actually, you know, glad that she had come, and, and then she didn't um, believe me, and I, and I said, who might you believe? And she said, how about to, you have someone that works at the court that you might know who, who could tell. Now, they don't, but just someone in authority, I think for her, someone in a suit would have been Barbara. So we went up to the prosecutor's office and I was friends with the prosecutor and she sat her down, Lori did. And I remember her telling her, right? And it was, I remember just being this moment for her about like, wow, I wonder what else he's told me 
that I've, I've believed. And this is so helpful. I mean, I mean it literally is like her world had opened up. So isolation is a risk factor that women have to contend with. Um, mm -hmm. And the more the system doesn't engage um, in contact with victims, um, the, the easier it is for him to isolate and to um, really control her thinking about what is going to happen. Just, it's just as, it's, it's as easy as two plus two is four. It's how it works, right? So, okay, next slide, please. So this just gives you a quick kind of view about all the different kinds of risks, um, not all the different kinds, but a lot of different kinds of risks that victims have to take up. So there's the one that the batterers generate, then there's one that the institutions generate, right? And so she's taking mm -hmm. up all of these things. Um, there's her immediate circumstances, which often for women is, is one of the, the, the highest priority risks that she's trying to contend with. If I leave him with four kids, can I stay out if I get out? Like, how am I going to make it mm -hmm. when I get out, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then there's aspects of culture. When we worked with in Duluth, we did a, 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 a lot of work around the evangelical Christian community. And one of the things that we, mm -hmm. we learned from the women is, is that their 911 was not the government. It was their pastor. Um, and pastors, when they started telling us stories about what pastors were doing when they called for help because you had just been assaulted, um, they were not helpful um, in those mm -hmm. situations, to say the least. So, um, so a woman um, who's being battered, we, when we're organizing risk, need to spend time talking to women about all these different ways in which she's making decisions about what could jeopardize her, her safety, um, her ability to live independently. All of those things are, are things that she's taken up. And what the system wants to do, the government system, is focus solely on the batterer, right? Like he's like lethality and, and, and reoffense. Um, and she knows his risks. That's, the, that's what she, she, she's clear on what that is. What, she's not, what she doesn't know how to necessarily navigate is the institutions, the, uh, her immediate circumstances, how to plan for that or how to address, say, the elders in their church community about um, how they're conducting um, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the social circle, the, the culture within that um, uh, church family. One of the things, Scott, I was thinking about, you know, when we had um, Judge Schulte from Duluth on a, a couple of webinars ago, one of the things I was thinking about when he was talking about how in Duluth you are still doing in-person hearings for orders for protection, but only allowing one support person. You know, I think this is an advantage to women. It may not seem like it right away, but I just, you know, remember so many women going to court with him for their orders for protection. And he literally, well, it felt like he brought the whole congregation of the church. I mean, yeah. the number of church people that came to support him. And so it's interesting to think about during the COVID pandemic about the restrictions about number of people. And I'm curious to hear, you know, for, from women, um, you know, uh, about that, because it was a big aspect when we talk about risk and culture, but how it really affects them. And um, I remember a number of another time when I was uh, meeting with a woman, she was working out order for protection, and her phone kept ringing. And I had said to her, I said, you know, it's okay if you want to answer it. She goes, it's my mom. And I said, well, it's okay. You, you can talk to her. She goes, do you mind if I do it on speaker? Because I want you to hear her talk to me. And I said, sure. So she answered it, kept it on speaker. And it was her mother. And her mother said, I saw your car at the Advocates. You need to leave there now. He's a good man with a good job. He will work on this. We will help him, right? I mean, this is her biological mother, right? And she knew, like in terms of risk, this is going to be, for her, this was her biggest concern, right? And, and a huge part of the risk that she had to deal with in, a, in an ongoing way. So I just have always appreciated this graphic um, that was produced because it helps us think about risk outside of just that, that he poses. Okay, so here's the questions that we start asking ourselves at the beginning of our process, um, um, where we've more recently kind of upgraded our, our coordinated community response um, um, system to risk. Who's going to collect the data um, for both context and risk? Um, who's in the best position to do that? Um, when is a victim most likely uh, to give the most information um, about what's been going on? 
uh, and that and that for us was law enforcement. Um, they were they were the ones on the scene first. They were the ones uh, repeatedly um, who are getting the most information from victims. And the the dilemma for us was that. We are we're now going to be asking them to collect more information than we already are. Um, and we have, you know, you can go on our website and look at what our uh, arrest protocol is uh, in Duluth and the kind of information they need to collect at the scene. So our police reports are eight to 20 pages long um, with what they've collected. And now we're asking them to do more. So one of the models that is out there is that law enforcement actually does a risk assessment at the scene. Um, we didn't go with that in Duluth for two reasons. One is, is that we were already asking law enforcement to do uh, a, ton of, uh, a ton of work at the scene um, to collect all this information. Um, we, we, just, as a, just as an example of why that's important, um, a lot of law enforcement agencies, most law enforcement agencies operate from the, 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 the standard of probable cause, um, which is a low standard of proof. Um, and one of the things that we've learned is that when you when you when you document a crime at the burden of probable cause, it really doesn't position the prosecutor in a coordinated response. It doesn't position a prosecutor to take that case and the evidence that's been collected to beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the highest burden. So we really need our law enforcement to be collecting information at the scene to beyond a reasonable doubt standard of proof, that level of detail, um, so that prosecutors can use what they produce. Um, so what we did is we didn't have the officers doing the risk analysis at the scene, but collecting the data because they were the, in the best position to do it um, from anybody else in the system. Um, then the next question was who was gonna analyze it, right? Um, and, and the DEAP, ended up being, we were all, we already had this relationship. We were getting all the police reports and giving feedback to the police department uh, and the sheriff's department on adherence to the policy that was already in place for officers. So if they, if they didn't ask the risk questions or they didn't uh, um, interview witnesses, then that advocate's job was to call the police department and let them know that this officer didn't, didn't follow through on the policy and then they would do the supervision. We changed that job so that that job now is the one who, who analyzes the risk. And, and the other advantage to it is instead of having 150 officers doing risk assessments on the street, we have one person consistently doing the same one. Um, she's the one analyzing all the data they collect. Um, how will it be organized based on need? So then that was a lot of conversation with probation at pretrial release. What is important information at the point of pretrial release for you to make an argument for what you think conditions need to be put in place for his his release. Um, judges, um, they just weren't going to be able to take up the kind of volume of information that we were collecting on each case every day. Um, so they wanted it organized in a particular way. Um, and, and so we can get you uh, that blank form of, of how we have put that together um, in Duluth. We've adapted it from a form that was created by Ellen in the Twin Cities on a, on a project called the Blueprint for Safety. We took that and we adapted it to our community uh, based on what our judges and prosecutors needed off that form um, in an efficient manner. So, you know, the judges, th their position was, um, we are the ones getting criticized for the kind of release decisions we're making. Um, but I know as a judge, this is a judge talking to me, I know as a judge that when I sit up on that, on that bench and I look out into the courtroom that everybody knows more about this case than I do. And he pointed at me and he said, it's your job to get what they know in front of me and respect due process. Well, that was about a two year process to figure out how do we systematically collect information that people are are documenting what falls within um, re respecting due process for the offender um, because the defense is going to get everything that we produce um, and then do it in a way that's efficient enough and helpful enough for the judge to make quick decisions at arraignment when they've got uh, an arraignment calendar that's that's going all morning. So that took us some time to figure out, um, but that's that's really what that work is if you want it to be coordinated. 
And then how does it get distributed? I mean, another big issue. Now you've decided what they need and how they need it. How's it gonna get from that agency to this agency when most government agencies are built siloed, right? They don't have those necessary links to take what I know and pass it on to the next practitioner. So we had to create all of those links in order to get that information to go efficiently from the police department to the prosecutor, to the judge, to the pretrial release agent, and to the advocates. Um, so they could all get that in real time at the same time by, in our case, um, about 9.30 in the morning um, is when we have to have that information done because we have arraignments at 11 uh, for in custodies. So um, that was our timeline that we had to figure that out in. All right. Next so Scott, slide. just for, you know, we have an international audience, just a term you use in custody uh, means correct. someone who was just put in jail, right? Likely the day before, the night before. Yes, they were arrested, taken into custody, and now they're being, uh, their first court appearance um, is, is uh, at 11 a.m. The typically the next day, sometimes it's one day after that. Mm -hmm. So data collection. So the first responders are typically positioned, as I, as I said, to gather the most detail and context of the abuse. Um, then what are the questions you're gonna have them ask? Um, and so that's a, that's a, that's a big conversation because um, they can't ask 100 questions. So what are the, the, the core questions that you wanna ask that's gonna give you the most context and risk information um, when women answer the question? Um, Community-based advocates get a lot of good information from victims, but they don't get it as quickly as law enforcement does. Um, especially if there's been, there's been no previous relationship. Um, and the other thing that we've learned too by doing these focus groups over so many years is that, um, uh, I mean, we as advocates, I, I mean, I, obviously I believe in our work, it's what we do, right? But it's also a reality that many victims, when you have all the agencies that she's coming in contact with at our table and you get releases and you, so you can all share information and you start sharing what you know about her. You can start seeing a pattern where she's telling this agency what they need to know because there's something that she needs. And then she's telling another agency something else that she, know, she knows about her experience because she needs something different from them. Like it's not that she's telling her whole story to everybody. She's telling what she needs to say, no more probably than she needs to say um, to, to that particular agency. So really first responders ended up being um, our, our focus. Um, and so probation, child protection, victim witness, they all come long after uh, that first event. And, and that the quality of that information begins to erode. Um, in fact, if you know, Melissa and I both do expert witness testimony, the main reason we do expert witness testimony is because victims recant um, by the, you know, even as soon as the next day. So really first responders are your best link um, to the most information that you're gonna be able to use uh, in, a, in a case that comes to a government agency. So Scott, just, um, I think one of the things, and it's related to a question, you know, that's here is about, um, you know, Minnesota is very different uh, right now in terms of the, the COVID-19 pandemic from other places in the U.S., you know, um, meaning that Minnesota has one of the lowest infection rates, um, you know, in the country of the, of the U.S. But at the same time, the, you say just a little bit about um, how the police chief um, in Duluth kind of came out and made a statement to, to kind of talk about that these cases will still be a priority, that they will take sort of precautions themselves, but and the importance of that in a community. And, and also, you told me about something you did yesterday, a little filming you did when we did our prep work. So can you, I think talking about that, I think is important for those who are thinking about how can we let our community know we're even here right at this time? Well, let's go back to what we started with. Isolation is a risk factor for, for victims. Um, and one of the things that we noticed in our community is that police calls have been down from to, to mm -hmm. previous years. Uh, order for protection filings are way down um, to what they normally are uh, last at, at this time of the year. Um, calls to victim advocacy agencies are down. So victims aren't reaching out and accessing, and we can speculate as to why that is. One of the things that we think it might be is that um, they don't know. There's, there's been things in the news that the, the jail uh, mm -hmm. has released some prisoners, um, and they're all low-level uh, offenders. They're not 
violent criminals. Um, it's just to reduce the, the jail population so that they can control people's spacing and if you know obviously control the the risk of, of a pandemic going through the to the jail population. So we wanted to make sure the community knew that if 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 you call us for help because of a domestic assault, um, we're here, right? That that that, mm -hmm. that is not the limitation. So the police chief, right from the beginning, um, the minute that the governor did our lockdown, made a public statement um, on their social media, uh, and one of the, and the only crime that he called out that they would be sure to respond to is domestic assault. Like we need you to know that, th that we're here. One of the things we just did yesterday is that our community partners all got together to do short videos um, that the city of Duluth is now gonna put together and put out to the community about domestic uh, violence, that, that uh, if you call us, we will, we will respond, um, that the jail uh, will take people into custody, that the victim advocates are here for you um, and can organize what you need. Like just you know, trying to break through the level of isolation that we know a lot of victims uh, are experiencing and let them know that we're here and we're ready to respond um, if you want to make contact with us. So, yeah, it's important, right? It isn't just it isn't just opening the door, uh, showing up for work, and 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 doing the job. It's it's thinking about what's it like for her, and and why might not victims be accessing the services that they normally would be accessing, um, and trying to and trying to find a way around that. Right. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, I, I, my experience with this um, situation of the COVID pandemic is that it hasn't changed a lot of people, but it's kind of shown a lot where where we have taken priorities in the past. We've taken extra priority. And in some communities where they didn't take a priority before, we haven't seen them, you know, doing it now, you know, in these right. sorts of cases. Um, that's been pretty consistent overall. That's that's a really important point uh, that I didn't make earlier when I said if it's really hard to fix a problem now because of the limited resources that people have um, given the pandemic. But um, but when we when the well, on the lockdown happened and everybody was was working from home and we lost access to police reports and so the risk information wasn't getting wasn't getting analyzed and distributed, um, we were able the, the it was never a question for us when we called our government partners, that this is important. Like it just, that right. was not ever an issue. The only issue we were trying to figure out is how do we logistically re rework this, what we're doing to make this work because it has to. Um, if mm -hmm. you're trying to convince somebody that this is an important issue now, oh, good luck. Um, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's just, they've got so many other things that they're doing and trying to manage. Um, that that uh, uh, it's too late, really. Um, uh, it's it's just it's it's going to be difficult to to get any movement. Um, so this is why ongoing coordinated work with your system is so critical for times like this, um, because we you know we didn't have to convince anybody that the that the that the response was important. Um, right. Just how we're going to do it. So this is an example. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about in coordinating responses is all the different ways in which uh, organizations are, are 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 organized to get workers to do a particular job given a similar set of circumstances, right? So one of those uh, organizing uh, steps is administrative practices. Those are the things that you create to help people do their jobs. So if the policy is that you have to collect risk and context information at the scene. This is a, 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 a administrative uh, uh, tool that can be given to law enforcement officers. They carry it in their in their breast pocket. There's a little book uh, cheat sheet that they carry around. Um, and when they get a domestic, they can pull that out um, and and they can read these these questions to the victim. Um, now, I'll give you an example. So these are the questions we ask to every victim of intimate partner domestic assault. Um, and the answers to these questions are really the core of how we analyze risk information uh, uh, and distribute that throughout the system. But just as an example um, of, of, uh, of an unintended consequence, if you look at the last question there, has he or she ever forced you to do things sexually you didn't want to? Um, 
the original version of that question, uh, we were hearing in focus groups, the, obviously the amount of sexual coercion that was going on um, in these relationships that nobody was capturing that. And it's actually a crime. Um, and so uh, we, the original version of this question was, has he, he or she ever coerced you to do things sexually you didn't want to? And after about six months, we were reviewing police reports and victims just were not asking, they weren't answering the question. Uh, and we thought, well, okay, maybe it's because it has to do with you know, a more intimate form of violence. Um, uh, we just didn't know what the answer was. So we went to a focus group, which we should have done in the first place, um, as opposed to a group of advocates thinking they knew the answers to these questions. And I, I remember sticking the, the, the question out to the focus group saying, okay, this is another example of a question that we're asking um, and we're not getting answers to. Would you answer a question like this? And the first question was, what's coerced mean? Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, Jesus, you know, right? So they said, they said it, why didn't you just say, has he ever made you do things you didn't want to? Yeah, why didn't we say that, right? I mean, it was just so obvious um, in a focus group with women, just simplifying the question. And now when we ask that question, we get all kinds of, of answers to that, to that question because we mm -hmm. simply um, didn't listen to women when we first put the, first formulated the question. So that's why it's important when you do all of this work to come up with what you wanna ask, you absolutely have to vet that, not just to the police department, not just to the prosecutor's office, um, not through just to the probation office to make sure that these are the kind of questions that are going to generate what they need, but you also have to talk to the women who are going to be asked these questions and say, is this a question you would answer? And <laughs> if not, how would you reformulate the question? What would be helpful, right? Um, and that's, from our experience, that's the piece that tends to get missed. Um, and and here, I just gave you an example of when we missed it. Um, not going back to the victims and asking them. Um, you're asking everybody else, but you really need to uh, have those relationships with, with women who are experiencing this violence and, and talk through what you're doing. It will so, improve Scott, your response, we, guaranteed. Yeah, so um, Nazif, if you could go back to that, yeah, just for a second, is because we have an international audience on here, and even just in the U.S., is just to reiterate that you know, sharing these examples of these questions here is, um, you know, I know it sometimes can be uh, tempting to copy and paste them in one institute in your community, but it's critical, like in an international way, you shouldn't use these because here, as an example, question number one is um, about guns. And we know that U.S. has more um, deaths as it relates to domestic violence and guns in most places in the world, not everywhere, but most places in the world, for example. So part of it is about, you know, these have to be things that are done um, based in your country and culture to look at, you know, looking at the deaths. Um, in your community, look at why women were killed there, and then bringing the questions to uh, focus groups of victims. I think there's someone on here from Georgia, but we did this in the Republic of Georgia in Eastern Europe. We worked with uh, the authorities at the ministry uh, there, the police ministry, and we did uh, focus groups with victims. And I remember when we had put in the proposal to work on this project, and the first feedback we got was, why do you need to, you know, talk to victims about this? You know, isn't this something for the police to use, right? And we said, it's because the police will be asking the victims this, right? You have to ask them in the way to victims in Georgia that are meaningful, right, um, for, for the culture and the community. And so that was a really um, big piece there. But we just want to caution people to not do that. And also, um, I know if you're going to get to this, Scott, to say that uh, in, besides this, uh, in Duluth, we also use the Odera, right? So I know, People at Global Rights for Women have looked at this and said, how come there's not a strangulation question on there, right? Because a lot of, this isn't the only sort of uh, questions, right, that, that get that risk. So just, just to clarify that, I think. Yeah, and one of the things that you're going to, you, what you would see is that uh, uh, when you talk to, uh, when the officer asks victims, you know, what's, do you think he'll seriously injure or kill you? Yes, why? Because he strangles me. Um, it's mm -hmm. a very scary form of violence that men use. In fact, uh, I, I sent Melissa, who can s make this available to all of you um, after the, the webinar, uh, an excerpt, a redacted excerpt from a Duluth police report on answers to the risk questions. Um, that particular uh, version was done before we've added a, a couple of the ones that you see here, but it gives you a sense of the uh, 
um, depth of risk and context information that we get from victims when they answer these questions at the scene. And these are the typically the kind of things um, that we get uh, uh, from from the answers to those those questions. Um, and and this is just a uh, this is just a partial list um, of of the things that we hear um, yeah. from victims when we ask these questions. And again, this uh, uh, Melissa can send this out too because she sent it for the last webinar. If you didn't attend that one, um, it's it's how we organize the information uh, for uh, the court, um, and then that that form that you're going to see that Melissa was just talking about with the Adara score on there, that also goes to all the other agencies, but they get a lot more. Um, and 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 that divert file, as we call it in Duluth, domestic violence response team file, that gets created every morning, um, lists all the uh, current uh, or all of the domestic assault arrests and the dispositions to those cases. Who the victims were? Is he is he abusing the same person over and over, or is uh, this individual abusing a number of women in our community? Um, and then all the order for protections that have been filed against this individual, and what the dispositions of those were. Um, and then at the bottom of that page is a summary of violence, so that um, at a quick glance they can see uh, what this individual is doing. And that was a really um, interesting thing that I've learned organizing risk information within government systems is that the trend in risk assessment to check boxes and give scores doesn't translate well to practitioners in the field. Um, mm -hmm. There's two things that get in the way. One is, is that practitioners don't want to give up discretion, right? So here's the score. This is what you do when you get the score. No, nah, I'm not doing that, right? I, I want to use my own, I'm not giving up my my position as a judge to a number, right? I'm going to make my own decision. I'll use that, but I'm not going to give up my discretion. Um, so that's a that's that's a that's a that's a big thing. Um, and uh, uh, now I've just uh, lost the second point that I was going to make, and I only had two. Um, well, I wonder, Scott, if it was because it's making me think. Also, is you know, Evan Stark wrote a good piece on. Um, I think he called it the dangers of danger assessments or the risk of risk assessments. And essentially what he said in this written piece, which I thought was really important, was that the problem with those that do the scoring is that it, it drastically minimizes the lived experience of victims in the low and medium, right? So um, for women who are living with a lot of coercive control, with a lot of emotional abuse, with a lot of psychological abuse, those things don't show up on the standardized tools as often, right? And so those men don't score as high. And, and so they, their experience gets diminished. And so that's why a lot of communities have sort of, re we've said, we'll sort of think about who's a high risk, but rejected the notion of medium or, or low risk, um, you know, sort of labels. Well, and so that reminds me of the, of the other point, and that is, is that um, they all, I, I, prosecutors, probation agents, judges, they all said, don't check a box that says his drinking is daily and that, that that's a risk factor for reoffense. I want to know what it's like for her to live with the guy who drinks like that, right? Mm -hmm. what, sexual coercion is a risk factor for, for uh, lethality. Okay, but give, uh, give me more than that. I want to know what, what is he doing, right? Um, and the particular case that was at hand when we were having these conversations was a guy who uh, had handcuffed um, his victim nude to a uh, radiator for two days and, and, and sexually assaulted her. The judge said, I mean, are you kidding me? How would you, this is all I get as a checkbox and I don't know that? Like mm -hmm. that has to be part of the context for this risk factor so that I know, like did he just walk out of the house and say I should have effing killed you? Or did he, write a letter like the example that I that you're going to get from this uh, excerpt um, from a police report where he wrote letters to her saying in detail how he was going to kill her and how nobody was going to find her. I want to know that guy versus that guy, right? Mm -hmm. Both did the same thing. Both threatened to kill, but what's the context of it, right? That's what I want to use my decision making, my professionalism as a judge, as a probation agent, pretrial lease agent. I want to use that to make decisions, um, and, I, and it gives me a much more credibility 
to argue that in front of the court when I know the context as opposed to just knowing a number. So we use yeah. the ODERA, but we also use a lot of the contextual information um, that tied to those risk factors so that it's compelling, it makes the violence visible in a way, uh, makes her life visible in a way to the court that is making direct decisions about things that could really impact her quality of life. Yes, yeah, Scott, I think the other thing just to mention at this point, since we have these risk factors here, is to reiterate a point we made last week, which is that in the COVID pandemic situation we're all in, is that the risk factors don't change. However, because of the social conditions in which people are living in, and we're all in, that the, that the outcome, right, of those risk assessments may be different. So do you want to maybe take a couple of these and sort of talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, so, uh, my, and again, there's so much we don't know right now, um, but one of the things that st uh, uh, st uh, strikes me is escalating physical violence over time. When we've got, in our jurisdiction, 85% of, uh, of the men in our, who get processed through our, our CCR live below the poverty line. They're not living in spacious places. Um, and if they're locked down in a place and they're drinking um, and they're not leaving, um, that the risk factors go way up. Um, and then the and then you know, one of the things about men who batter that's just, you know, again, one of those as common as air, is that they're gonna use whatever that they have at their disposal as leverage to get her to submit. So we've been tracking all the police reports that have been coming up where victims have mentioned the pandemic as part of the violence. And we're collecting all of that. And, and when this is over and hopefully that soon, we're gonna put that all together so that we can see the, the range of ways in which this is being used. So for example, um, I'm not gonna let you see your, your, your child on a court ordered visit because um, the governor has shut us down. Now that is not what the governor has said. That's not what the Minnesota Supreme Court has said, but now he's got that as leverage, so he's gonna use it. Um, a, a man assaults a woman um, in, in, in our community and uh, the next morning she's gonna take her child and go to her sister and live with her sister because there's not obviously a lot of places for her to go. And then he pulls a gun out the next morning and puts it to her head and says, um, you're not leaving, you're not taking my child out and risking my child to the virus, right? I mean, those are just some of those examples that we're seeing. So he's threatened to kill, right? That risk factor doesn't change. How that risk factor, the context in which that risk factor is coming up changes, right? Now he's using the pandemic as a, as a reason, um, as a justification. Uh, and, and then he's, and then, and there's so, Again, this is just, if you work with this population of offender, um, it's so common, is that even when the police arrive, he's telling the police as a way to convince them, well, she's trying to take my child. Uh, one guy had broken into the house and was searching her bedroom because he thought somebody was sleeping over there who could put his child at risk. And when the police arrived and arrested him, um, he said, well, hey, um, I'm just trying to protect my child um, from, from the virus because she's got people sleeping over in her bedroom, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it's all that kind of stuff um, that's happening. Um, and again, all the risk factors are the same. Um, it's just the context in which they're happening um, that we have to pay attention to. Yeah, we had a guy recently who uh, he's not with his partner anymore. And um, he, because now he lives alone and because you know this level of shutdown sort of isolates us all, he's um, found himself really just sort of with so much alone time sort of obsessing about her, right? He said, I've realized, right, because as a person who does men's group, and you can talk about this too, Scott, it's like we're doing some COVID check-ins with the guy. He just said, you know, he said, what I'm finding myself doing is thinking about her way too much and more than I ever did before. And he said, part of it's just like, you know, like I, I can't go do the things I, I did for hobbies before, right? I'm just sitting at home and I find myself just like looking on her social media and I created this extra social media so I could see what she's doing. And you know, like, it's like, I, I 
I didn't do that before when I was busy with other activities. So I was thinking it was just an, another example. Right. Next slide, please. So this is the this is the ex, excerpt that that you're going to get, and when you get the uh, uh, this excerpt, but what you're going to see um, is uh, we've we've bolded the risk factors, and then we've put in red the entitlement. Um, so one of the questions that so so you can assess for risk, right? The the risk factors that we know statistically uh, are tied to this population of offender. But what we, but what also is really important is that we know who, we know the kind of guy that she's dealing with, right? And so paying attention when when law enforcement officers are collecting this, not just risk information, but context, his entitlement, like all the things that he mm -hmm. says that go to his notion that he gets to be the one that tells her what to do. Um, like one of the statements that you're going to see in that particular excerpt is. Um, you had my baby, I can do anything I want to you. You have to do everything I say, right? Those kind of statements help us as practitioners know who we're dealing with, right? So a lot of times in communities, they're wondering, well, is this actually a situation where this is ongoing battering or is this something that is um, uh, an individual bad night? Well, when you're collecting mm -hmm. this kind of context, you get a much clearer picture um, of who you're dealing with here because those kind of statements um, that she reiterates to law enforcement um, help us know, okay, this violence is ongoing. This individual isn't going to stop because he got arrested. Um, this, she's gonna continue to be at risk because this guy is battering her uh, as opposed to uh, an individual act of violence. Next slide, please. So you've uh, collected the, the data. Uh, We've analyzed the data, um, and 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 how are you going? Like, what are you going to use as your as your point of uh, analysis? And in Duluth, there was a lot of debate about risk, which risk tool we were going to use. Um, and one of the things that 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 we decided on, and again, this is what we decided on. I'm not saying this is the only way to do this, obviously, but what we decided on is that. Um, from the advocates, um, the victims wanted to have their conversations with the advocates private. Um, and the advocates were routinely doing the dangerousness assessment with, with, with victims. They did not want that, the answers to those questions going uh, anywhere um, in, into the court system. And the ODERA risk tool was the one that only required public information uh, publicly documented information to complete it. Um, and so, as I said, our risk score is just one piece of a of an analysis, of an evaluation of risk um, that we're putting together for the system. Um, and the ODERA was the one that we could use and just pull public data and quickly do that um, the next morning before this individual was arraigned at their first appearance in court. Um, and so that became our actuarial risk assessment um, that we did that we did, that we do in Duluth. Um, and then and then when do they need it, right? So if you're going to analyze the data, you have to take up how quickly people in the system are going to use it. So in Superior, Wisconsin, we have until so, 1 p.m. Scott. Yes. Or sorry, the question about can you say ODERA is an acronym? And there've been a couple of questions about what is ODERA, oh, so you can sorry. just give it a little con before you continue to talk about it. Yeah, it's the Ontario Domestic Assault Risk uh, Assessment. Uh, it was created in Ontario. Police use that at the scene, I believe, um, where it was originated. We cho we chose not to have our law enforcement actually do the ODERA at the scene. We chose an advocate to do it. Um, actually, she's not an advocate. She's a uh, our men's program coordinator, but that's part of her job is to go in and uh, and analyze the data every morning and, and produce this uh, information. So um, thinking about those timelines, the ODERA fit in well um, for us to be able to, uh, Pat gets at the, at the police department at 6.30 a.m. and uh, she gets those police reports uh, in Minnesota, that's uh, by statute, uh, that we get those reports uh, 
uh, at request with no, at no charge. So this is how we've organized getting them. And, and she puts together these risk files and it had to be a, a tool that was efficient enough for us to be able to get all that information um, to the court for, so that they had enough time to analyze it and make their arguments, prepare their arguments for pretrial release before that first appearance in court. So a lot of the, you can just see how many different moving parts there are. Um, you're just not going to sit down and say, all right, we're going to pick this risk tool and we're going to make everybody else uh, fit um, this tool. No, you got to find a tool that fits the resources your system has and the timelines that your system um, is under to get this information and make these decisions. Scott, mm -hmm. one thing I just wrote in the chat, which is related to that, is about also that getting those police reports wasn't easy, that we had to work with our allies in the legislature in Minnesota to have to require police um, departments to give advocacy agencies um, those reports, because it was such a struggle in so many parts of the state. And this is a big thing that a lot of states have had to do and others had had to, you know, worked on in other countries because otherwise police weren't willing to give those over. Right, and I and I and and doing a, a coordinated response when when organizers in the community don't have access to the police reports is extremely difficult um, because this is the cornerstone of if it's if you're thinking about the government's case, this is the cornerstone of it, and if you mm -hmm. don't collect this at the scene, it doesn't exist. Nobody's going to get that in later. It's not coming in any other way, right? So it has to be collected there. And police, the response typically is going to be, well, um, that's not my job. My job is to determine a probable cause uh, for a crime occurred and make an arrest. But in a coordinated response, your job is going to shift. It's going to take on more responsibility because you're linking your product to the needs of other agencies who all are going to use your report for a different reason that all has to be incorporated into what that police report eventually ends up looking like. And if you don't have access to those, you'll never even know what they're doing, much less how to adapt what they're doing to fit everybody's needs. It's, it, it really is a barrier, so. Right. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're distributing it, right? So one of the things that was one of the most difficult things in our, uh, uh, We'd collect the data on the street, right at the scene. That report would then go into um, some administrators within the police department who would clean up the grammar and, and all of that. That changed the content, but just clean it up so it was ready to be used by a prosecutor. Then it would go um, to a sergeant, and it could, in, in a sense, it could die at that point. Um, and we would not have access to that if that sergeant didn't forward it. But there was nothing internally in the police department that required that report to go to this domestic violence response team, which was made up of uh, investigators and uh, staff from DEIP and staff from our uh, two local advocacy agencies who all would meet every morning um, on the previous days in custody arrests um, and, and analyze and put together those files. So we had to we had to work with with uh, uh, the administration of the law enforcement agency to formally change the way that all of those reports get distributed or processed through the police department, so that every domestic ended up on the lap of a divert team member. Um, and you might think, well, that that isn't that wouldn't be that hard. It 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 is. You're changing the way that people do their jobs and. We don't do things in Duluth on a handshake because the minute that hand that you just shook gets promoted or retires, so does your response. So we want to institutionalize it in policy. When that report gets processed and puts on the sergeant desk, that sergeant will pass that on to the divert team. Um, and, and, and so now you're going to get compliance because it's part of, it's, it's how the uh, agency is organized. So, Data distribution is important. How do we then get it to the courthouse after we get it done? How do we get it to the prosecutor and what do they need? How do we get it to the probation pretrial release agent and what do they need and when do they need it? Um, uh, and so all of those were long conversations going back and forth saying, what about this? Tweak that, go back, tweak it for them, tweak it for the other agency. Um, 
And so that, that was about a two year project, just figuring out uh, once we've collected it, how are we gonna analyze it and how are we gonna distribute it and how are we gonna create the formal channels um, where this information is gonna get passed so that there isn't a way for it to fall through the cracks. It's institutional <clears throat> in how it's um, uh, directed through agencies. And Scott, I think the other piece is, is I remember when John and I started Pathways to Family Peace and we got our first couple of referrals and I sent those to John and, um, and John said, wow, you get this on every case, right? I mean, so, and you and I who both do batteries intervention program work with perpetrators of domestic violence, like having that information, right? Um, is like gold, right? For when you're working with him so that when he talks about a certain thing, we have a context of how to hear it, right? right? So when he, you know, as you know, and we've been doing men's group now for 20 years, is that, you know, when men start to talk, most of them minimize, right? And, and that's expected, that is what it is, right? But to, for us to have a different reference point is like, you know, to the story he's talking about, it's just like absolutely critical. Um, because if you don't have that, and if you're a better intervention program who's not part of a coordinated community response, right, it's just, it's, it can be really problematic. And one of the other things about this distribution, and, and thinking about probation uh, specifically, um, is that those risk factors that don't just go to lethality or, um, or reoffense, which we talked about, that's what the system tends to focus on but take up all the diversity of risk points for her, mm -hmm. probation really wanted to know what that was. And they were getting that through all the context. They weren't just getting the score, right? They're getting the context. Um, and then that helped them determine for that, for that week who the high risk offenders were. Um, and so that, uh, another piece to this that uh, I haven't mentioned, it's that we found crucial to good execution on risk information is to create dedicated teams of domestic violence units um, who this is what they do. Because again, the, the understanding and remembering what all these risk factors mean and, and which one's lethality and which one is reoffense and what's, you know, it's hard when they've got a hundred different cases that they're, they're managing. As the social worker said, my brain starts the morning with a child sex abuse case then I go to uh, a mother who's, who's using and neglecting her child. And then I go to a domestic assault case. Every one of these takes a different brain. And it's really hard for me to learn how to be good with domestics because I, what I tend to wanna do is use the same brain for everybody. And, mm -hmm. and when I do that, somebody's gonna lose, right? So um, we're really a strong proponent of creating uh, specialized units that can quickly learn this information uh, efficiently use it, understand it in its depth, um, and then create these uh, risk uh, lists of guys that are dynamic. Because one week this guy might be high risk, the next week he might fall off the list because somebody else is higher risk. You can't, just because that's how you uh, analyzed him at the front end of a case, doesn't mean that that's where he's going to land risk-wise six months after this case is taken to adjudicate it and get it into a supervising agent. Um, so you need this, you need a dynamic way of building on that and adding to it um, uh, as that case goes along through the system. All right, next slide, please. Um, so we, I've talked about the domestic violence response team file. Um, and you're gonna get a handout on, on what all the components of that are. Um, domestic violence risk management tool, um, that's that form that you're gonna get a copy of. So you'll see how we lay out um, that information. That's what the court, that, that sheet, that, that tool is what the court gets. Everybody else gets that too, but that's all the court gets because that's as much time as they have to take up. And then the city attorney's office bail memo. Now, one of the interesting dilemmas that we have in Duluth is that our prosecutors don't attend arraignment in misdemeanor cases. It's just how things are. And that's, it's a resource issue and it's, and it's not something that's going to change. So how then were we going to get city prosecutors to analyze risk and get that information to the court prior to this individual's first appearance? 
So we had to do a lot of work um, on our end to create a quick, efficient memo that when they get the divert file with all the information as a prosecutor, they also get in the city attorney's office a bail memo that it takes them literally uh, a few minutes to fill out. And basically, they're just putting into the court what conditions they're recommending um, get put into place, whether it's bail or release or bail and release conditions. Um, and we had to do that work for them because they simply did not have the resource to do it the way the county attorney's office, which prosecutes higher level crimes, gross misdemeanor and felonies, they had the staff to do it. City's attorney's office didn't, didn't have it. So we had to come up with a different tool for them to accomplish the task. Again, that's part of risk work. You can't just create a risk tool and assume everybody's gonna be able to use it. You have to look at the resources and say, do they have the capacity to use it the way it's been designed? Or do we have to, do we have to manipulate that in a way to fit their resource base um, and still be able to accomplish the risk um, analysis that we want that we want done? So Scott, there's a question about, is there also a similar risk team for Department of uh, Social Services? And um, you know, I know a little bit about that, but I want you to answer because I know that some of that work is new. Can you just say a little bit about that work with um, Child Protective Services? Yeah, so um, right, so we, we were having meetings. Um, this is what the recommendation is. We spent two years um, just basically analyzing the way child protection and investigations takes up these cases, talking to victims, observing practice, um, uh, and, and figuring out what the best recommendations are for, for changing that system to meet the, the needs of victims. And, and one of those recommendations was a dedicated team. That was almost to the day that our lockdown happened was the, was the meeting we were having <laughs> that did not happen. So that's on hold until we can get back to some level of normalcy, normalcy. but overwhelmingly, this is what uh, came from the frontline workers. We cannot do child sex abuse and domestic cases uh, and, and, and neglect cases all at the same time. It's just, I will never be good at this, um, this particular case. I need to focus on these particular cases. So that looks like, I uh, can't make a commitment, but that looks like the direction we're gonna go. Um, and we're going to hopefully have one of our staff members um, as part of that, the same way we have a domestic violence response team. Now, one thing I'll tell you about how risk impacted them as a, as a child protection agency, they were doing their own thing around risk, but which, which wasn't much. It was basically the individual social workers own thinking about risk. Um, and every worker had a different way of thinking about it. So there was no standardized way of doing it. So one of the first things they said is that we don't get all the police reports from, from our police department and we're not, we don't feel like the information we're getting is uh, consistently reliable. So we loop them in. So now the divert file doesn't just go to probation, the court and the prosecutors and advocates. It also goes to, um, it also goes to child protection. And there was an amazing shift that happened. So if I don't care if I'm in the United States, Canada, England or Australia, Advocates, domestic violence advocates complain about the fact that child protection workers penalize and focus on victims um, with all of their leverages as opposed to offenders. That the offenders just kind of disappear because they don't have any leverage over them. When they started getting these divert files routinely in child protection, it, without any other thing involved in it, uh, like us training or whatever, they began to see the context in which this woman was living. The judge, the level of judgment went down dramatically for victims um, who couldn't get away from offenders because they, I mean, I just, I, I heard the workers, I understand what she's up against. I see the problem, right? It just shifted the focus. And so now, um, so much more conversation is happening within child protection about the offender and what needs to happen in relation to him. Because prior to that, all the information was about victims. And was it, is, it, is it a stunner that they, their focus was all about victims because all their information was about the victim, right? 
but now they're getting a lot of risk and context information about the offender, and that's shifted it dramatically and brought the judgment for victims way down. Um, we saw that happen in the criminal system, but we didn't see it to the degree that it happened within child protection. Um, so again, this is a this is a reason why you do risk a good risk work. Um, and again, it isn't just a score. It's the context of those risk factors that help people understand, make her life visible to them so they have a better way of intervening and a better way of understanding what will or will not help um, by what resources they have to offer. So Scott, there's another question I want to make sure I get to, which is to your thoughts and a little bit about what um, you're doing there in Booth as it relates to working with perpetrators um, during COVID. Um, is there a way to you know, engage with perpetrators at this time without potentially putting victims at even higher risk? And just sort of some of your, your thoughts you know, um, about that. This person mentions that maybe they're working on maybe having a 24-hour hotline um, that, that they may have, but thoughts on what more could be done as it relates to this during the COVID pandemic. Yeah, I, I, here's the thing. Um, whether you're making phone calls, whether you're doing a 24-hour hotline, whether you're doing online groups, um, all those things, we're going to learn how effective they are at some point. Um, I guess the way to think about it is, um, give if there's a way for you to collect some information about your population that you're going to be working with um, to give you some confidence that what you're going to do might have some resonance. So uh, in Duluth, our process first was um, making sure that our coordinated response, given how it, everything was scattered and shut down, was still going to continue. Um, that took um, a good two weeks of work with the different criminal justice partners and, and, and child protection to make sure that that was in place. That was our priority because that's the place that victims call first if they need help. Um, so then the next step is um, how, do we, how do we learn about what I'm talking about right now? How do we learn about the landscape? And we started with our offenders. Now again, I'm not saying this is the way to do it. I'm saying this is what we did it and we don't know what the answers are yet. We're going to learn that down the road, um, but we don't know. So what we did is we called all the offenders that we could get a hold of first. We got about a 50% response rate and found out that most of the guys are not living with her. That's helpful to know. Um, we also found out in our population that although most of the guys have access to the internet, the majority of that's with a limited data phone line. And that wouldn't that wouldn't be conducive to an online group. But there is a population of guys that we have that could participate in an online group. So I think we're gonna move in that direction. I also think we're gonna move in making phone calls, structured phone calls with the guys and see what that, how that works. Um, here's what I'm encouraging everybody to do because people are doing this all over. Um, but really document what works and what doesn't. Um, I'm on a, I, many of you might be on the Aquila listserv and as I am, and you know, I'm reading what people are doing and, and listening to what other folks are uh, trying and I don't ever hear any mistakes. Like there's, there's no mm -hmm. way that we're, we're that good at doing this work. And, and it really is helpful to learn when things fall short, when things didn't work the way that you'd hoped and why that was right. So the rest of us can know that information too. Um, this problem obviously is a complex and has a long history to it. And if, if there's only a handful of agencies that are doing the collection and the distribution of what they've learned, it really limits the rest of the field. I'm really encouraging all of you who are trying all of these, these ideas, first think through what is it, what's it gonna make, mean for her for us to do this, right? That's the number one question. Um, is it going to make it worse for her if, I, if we try this this, uh, this initiative. Um, and, and if you don't know, try to find out, right? So we know the guys that are not living with the victims right now, we're gonna make phone calls. In fact, there was just a call with the advocates in our agency as I was doing this, to come up with a list of questions to ask those women about their recommendations for what we should be doing right now. Um, that's gonna give us a tremendous, tremendously more confidence 
um, to try different initiatives to try and respond to this this pandemic um, that, that is unprecedented for anybody alive today. So, um, so yeah, that's what we're thinking. But I can't tell you that those are the right those are the right initiatives because we don't we don't know. Um, but what I do encourage you to do is try and get a hold of the victims um, in your community and find out what they think you should be doing and how you should do it. Great, thanks, Scott. So we just have about a minute left, of course. So uh, do you want to just share some lasting thoughts here and well, kind of maybe any, talk? We've talked most about we've talked about this for the most part, um, but I think one of the things that just kind of uh, tags on to what I was just saying about talking to victims is that um, uh, if you want if you want more than a risk score, you're going to need context. And you're mm -hmm. not going to know what to ask about if you're not talking to victims about their experiences. What's it like to live with a guy who, right, is committing this kind of violence against his family? Um, what are all the ways that we need to think about this? And then if we, when we collect that information, now how are we going to ask the question? How are we going to ask the question in a way that, that she's going to feel comfortable answering to a police officer at two in the morning? And I can give you an example where we have these things in Minnesota called DANCOs. They're domestic abuse no contact orders. They're actually criminal no contact orders that are issued at arraignment um, that if he breaks it, it's another domestic assault. Um, and so they're a serious no contact order. Um, but there's no provision in the, in the statute that lets victims know what those are, um, or that they even got issued. So we wanted to be able to create a way that victims would know that, that when this individual is, goes to his first appearance, this is what's gonna be possibly issued. And if you want to have input into that, here's an advocate you can call who can relay that to the court so that your wishes can be in front of the judge. And uh, I remember an advocate and I sat down with all of our brilliance and we wrote um, what that would look like on a, on a blue card that police give to every victim at the scene um, that has their rights and everything else on it, but also this information about these Dankos. And we did a focus group, bring the women together, put out what we are uh, our brilliant analysis of, of what this Danko was and how it was going to get issued and and the women just basically threw it back to us and said well I wouldn't I wouldn't even read that <laughs> well why not and again what she said Scott it's two in the morning they've just arrested my husband um, they've taken him into custody my kids are upset I don't have vacation time I got to go to work I'm not reading two pages like this has two sides to it that's not going to happen right mm -hmm. So can you then all put this together in a way that would be meaningful to you at the scene at two in the morning in that circumstance? And they rewrote it over the course of a couple of weeks and it got cut to about a third. Um, and now it's written for victims by women who've experienced this violence um, as opposed to an advocate. This is the kind of thing that you get when you partner with, with uh, the women who've experienced this violence in your community is a much better response and a lot less likely to create unintended consequences um, by doing those focus groups. Right, and Scott, just to say for people, you know, who are maybe thinking, boy, it took Duluth over 40 years to get to this point, you know, like, <laughs> where should we even start? <laughs> you know, because it is, it's been that, you know, the blueprint was just in 2015 when I was there, and that was, you know, four years of work that you, you know, certainly led and we are all a part of, but I, I think the thing that to, to your point also is that people should start with gathering a group of women who are currently not in a crisis stage, you know, right. stage of their life. They've had some time to reflect and look back and that we strongly believe in you compensating victims for your time in some sort of way. And just begin by learning from them. Take a particular part of your response, sit women down and learn from them um, about that response. I get, a, I get calls all the time, what should our agenda be? And I said, what are the, what are the women said it should be? Because they'll give you, you'll, mm -hmm. they'll give you a, an agenda that'll take you two years to complete, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and, and that might be another call, but that's, it's, there's, other, there's different ways to do focus groups. Um, and there's a particular way that we do a focus group on how we ask questions to get particular system impact information um, so that we can bring that back to the system and reform the way that they respond to more fit um, what victims need. Um, but yeah, those conversations, without that, we would have no idea um, how, to, how to change what we do in the system. Yeah. Right, right. 
Well, we're at the end of our time, so we want to be respectful of people's time. Perfect for the last slide, you know, thank you. So we will send out the PowerPoint to you in PDF form, and then also the number of attachments that um, Scott referred to. Um, we will also, um, for those of you who may need a CLE, um, you can communicate with us um, about that for continuing um, learning education or CLU credit. We're happy to uh, converse with you about that via email. But thank you so much, Scott, for your time here today. Um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback. I'll see you again at 7. We're doing this uh, again at 7 Central tonight for our Pacific Island Australian uh, Australia uh, friends in that part of the world. So uh, we'll see if it's different or the same or <laughs> when it happens then. Mm -hmm. But thank you, Scott. Any last thoughts? No, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Great. Thanks.